نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبنت منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ثم أما بعد عباد الله فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة أجارنا الله وإياكم من عذاب النار فإن كل ضلالة إخواني في الله مآلها إلى النار ثم أما بعد عباد الله فاعلموا أننا عندما نعيش في هذا الزمان ونتذكر ما كان في زمان سابق لا نخرج عن سياق الزمان فإنما نتعظ ونعتبر كما كان الله سبحانه وتعالى يسلي نبيه محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم بالقصص والعبر والعظات التي حصلت في الأمم السابقة فقد ذكر الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم قصص الأمم الغابرة مثل ثمود وعاد وفرعون وأصحاب الأيكة وقوم تبع كل هؤلاء ذكرهم الله لنبيه حتى يكون لنبينا سبحانه وتعالى في ذلك صبر وسلوان حتى يستطيع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أن يتحمل على الدعوة فإن الدعوة إلى الله من أصعب المسالك وأشدها وأكثرها خطورة وإنها والله لمحفوفة بالمهال فإما أن تكون المهالك من أعداء يتربصون بأصحاب الدعوة وإما من جهال يقفون على رؤوس الدعوة يدعون أنهم يدعون الناس إلى عبادة الله وهم يدعون الناس إلى الضلالة والبعد عن الله وقد ظهر عبر الزمان أقزام كثار ادعوا العلم وتطاولوا على أهل العلم بل نصبوا لأنفسهم مجالس وصارت تفرغ لهم الأماكن في البيوت والمساجد والفضائيات Brothers, we always speak about the old generations, the nations who were before us. And when we talk about those history, we don't talk about them to take you out of the current time. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have reminded his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, of the stories of Fir'aun and Qawm Luq. And أصحاب الأيكة and قوم تبع he had told him all those stories so الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم can he can find a peace of mind by knowing that he is not the first one to be denied not the first one to be declined by his own people Allah had told him يا محمد don't worry you are not the first one to be declined then the prophets before you, they have been denied by other people, by their own people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
have always gave Muhammad Sallallahu the examples. So he can see that whenever you call for the da'wah of the haqq, you will be fight. Everyone will fight you. Everyone will deny you because you're calling for the haqq. The haqq, brothers, is hard. Hard to accept. Because the life is too easy. The way it is, without committing to the religion. Every time when you go in da'wah, you will find different enemies. Don't be surprised if some of the enemies will be from your own people. And don't be so surprised if one of the enemy will be your father or your brother. The haq is hard. The haq is hard to be accepted. Not from a man, not from a woman. If you tell a sister today, put on your veil. She will tell you, what's wrong with you? Are you an extremist? Today, when you tell the people, Salat, Ibadah, Halal, Haram, they say, oh, he's taking his religion too serious. What is too serious? You have no choice but to be serious about your religion. When you remind him of the Akhirah, of the Jannah, of the Hellfire, he will look at you and will say, what is wrong with this guy? We are not in the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi anymore. The Jannah and the Hellfire will be to the end of the time. It's a reminder, not only for you, for your grandchildren as well. People in this dunya find Islam too heavy. Today, if you say, La ilaha illallah, and you go to the masjid, and you say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad rasulullah If you wear your Islamic clothing, they will call you an extremist. And if you leave your beard, then they will doubt. This guy has something behind him. That is the scenario going in beneath the tables. Back in the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when you have your beard on, oh, when you have your thobe and your Islamic clothing, and you go to the masjid, and you call the people to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have one name, Muslim. But today you have different names. He is an easy Muslim, he is not practicing Muslim, he is extremist Muslim, or oh, he is a terrorist. A few days ago, I met some Mexican guy. His name is Omar. And he had beard. And I told him, are you a Muslim? He said, no. It is just a name in Mexico. They used to call us this way. I said, well, I think you should practice Islam already because they will call me terrorists anyway. He got all he got. He got the beard, he got the name, and you have Roma. This is one of the hardest names for the non-believers. Brothers, our religion is beautiful. But we make it awful by our, by our deeds. When you lie to someone who is not Muslim, he's not going to say, Tariq is like this, Muhammad is like this, he say, look at the Muslim. When you cheat, they will say, look at the Muslims. When you become lazy and prefer to be a low life person, and instead of being educated and having the best rank in the dunya, they will say, look at the Muslims. It's their places. They, this is what they are about to be. They don't go above that. They can't. They're too lazy. They don't like to educate themselves. They're too not clean. It is shameful that when someone leaves his beard for a few days, they think that maybe he's having some psychological problems. Maybe he's under debt. That's why he didn't cut the beard. And you'll be so ashamed when a Muslim comes to you and says, What's wrong with you, Akhi? What's wrong with your beard? Are you okay? It becomes a sign of illness, not the healthy sign of being a Muslim. When you become so ashamed for anyone to know that you are Muslim, and you call yourself names like Mo. What is Mo? Oh, it's just a name so I can blend in. They know that they are Muslim. They know. And the sad part, they know that you're not too proud. This is the sad part. Why? Why to embarrass yourself? Why? 
What is the point behind that? You come to the masjid, maybe every Friday, maybe every Ramadan. So we have three group of people. The people who pray every day, they are in the premium, the premium league, huh? the league of Islam. And the people who come every Friday, so they call them the Fridays people. And the Ramadan people, and they are the Ramadanist people. Huh? And there are groups who pray, but they don't read the Quran. But they read the Quran every, every Friday. So they call them al kah people. Because they only read the Kah every Friday. And there are other groups who doesn't read the Quran except in Ramadan. So they are the Ramadanist prayers and the readers of the Quran. I wonder, if you are only Muslim on Fridays and Ramadan, what about the rest of the years? What are you? I can't say who are you because some, somehow it feels like you are something it is. Not he is. Because the only person who doesn't have the brain to think is not even a person. It's an animal. Because animals, they just live their life. They're living based on their instinct. They fight to survive. They hunt to eat. What about you? Allah has given you this gift called Aql. We read Surah Al-Fatiha every day. 17 times. I mean like, for a regular Muslim, I don't know about the others. Who maybe does only Asr or maybe he does only Maghrib. So let's assume that he do it from 4 to 7 times. But still, you're reading the Fatiha. Everyone knows the Fatiha. But have you ever asked yourself, what is the Fatiha about? It's something that you do every day. Everywhere you go, if you go to Australia and go to a message, you're going to read the Fatiha. And you're going to read it the way, the way it is. You're not going to change it. It's not because the Australian people have different accents, you're going to change the fact they have. You're going to read the fact they have the way it is. But have you asked yourself, what is the mean of the fact they have? What is Fatiha all about? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have put the Fatiha on the top of the Quran? Why the Fatiha been so glorified? Why it was so special that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hijr, He had told, his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we have gave you the Holy Quran and the couples, the seven couples, which is a sabr al-mata'il. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَاكَ سَبْعًا مِنَ الْمَثَانِيَ وَالْقُرْآنَ الْعَظِيمِ That's mean that it is an added value. It is not considered as only just in the Quran. No, it's something special. And in the hadith, the Prophet was sitting and Jibreel was with him. And then they both hear some noise coming from the sky. Jibreel looked at the sky and he told the Prophet there is a door in the sky have been opened. It was never opened before. And there is an angel come, came down. He never came down before. So that angel came to Muhammad Sallallahu and he told him, Abshir, you have been given Something none of the prophets before was given. And that was Surah Al-Fatiha and Khawatim Surah Al-Baqarah. <coughs> you need to know the stories behind the Surah Al-Fatiha. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so special? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about Surah Al-Fatiha in the hadith Qudsi qasamtu salata bayni wa bayna abdi nisfayn. You see, he said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he called the Fatiha as salat And this is one of the reasons that some of the Imams, like Imam Shafi, Ahmad bin Hanbal, they said that the Fatiha is an obligation. You have to bring it in the salat. Based on the hadith, Rasulullah said, لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بفاتحة الكتاب. لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ بأم الكتاب. The salat is not accepted for a person who prays without reciting Surah Al-Fatiha. From that, they take this is an obligation. You have to bring the Fatiha every rak'ah. Mm -hmm. And then there is the argument whether you can read it behind the Imam or not. Some group they say it's not necessary because they, they read the Hadith of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Qira'at al-Imam, Qira'at al mamum If the Imam recites, then <coughs> it's okay for the Ma'mum to listen. And there is different opinions on this matter. But what is matter is that the Fatiha is an obligation. You have to read it every Salah. 
And look at the special event that happened that the sky was open in a very special moment when the Fatiha came to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, I have divided the Salat. And He called Fatiha Salat between me and my slave into two halves. In the first half, that what you do every day. You say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Ibn Abbas said that Ar Rahmanir Rahim is a grace after another grace. Ni'matun ba'da ni'mah. The mercy repeatedly coming to you when you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. When you say that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that my own slave have thanked me. And then when you say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, my slave complimented me. Imagine. Wallahi, some of us, we just don't understand. Some people, they don't know even if they do it right or not. It just becomes like, you know, a sound with H's up and down, that's it. And he finished. Like our Mu'addin, one day he said, I was sitting here. And I was doing my subhanallah. He said, subhanallah, 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 seven times. The person next to him, he finished the first rak'ah. What did he do in this first rak'ah? Allahu Akbar. I mean, there is tasbih, there is fatiha, there is takbir. That doesn't take seven tasbih. <coughs> Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, he will say that my slave have complimented me. You have to feel it when you read it. You have to live with it, because this surah is about glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking his help, asking his guidance, and then making dua for yourself. And guess what? If you make the surah correctly, Allah will forgive your sin. You will say, how? Let's continue the hadith. He said, and then when my slave says, Maliki Yawmiddin, the owner of the day of judgment, because in different riwayat, like Warsh, they say, Maliki Yawmiddin, the king of the day of the judgment. Also, I said, I'm said in the hadith, those who have called themselves Shah and Shah, the king of the kings, he said, this is the worst name in the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because there is no such king of kings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king of kings. In that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, where are the kings? Where are the emperors? Where are the strong people? Ayn al jababira and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask, Man al-Malik? And nobody will be there to answer. Because by that time, Malik al maut will take every soul, even the angels. And he will end up taking his soul. It will be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will respond to himself saying, Ana al-Malik. Every day, you establish that meaning 17 times. A day, Maliki Yawmiddin. He is the king, the owner of the day of judgment. Nobody equal to him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you say that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, My slave have glorified me. Allah will be happy with you. Allah is always happy when you thank him. And guess what? If you thank someone more than once, at the first time he'll say, Okay, Jazakallah khair, thank you. Second time he said, Okay, Jazakallah khair. Third time he said, I say Jazakallah khair. Fourth time, maybe he kick you, right? Maybe he punch you. Because he has sinned, thank you too much. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter how much you thank him, he will give you more. Look at the difference between the creator and the creature. Big different. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have said about himself, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ 
There is nothing equal to him. And he is the one who hears and sees. <clears throat> and guess what? He said also, وَلَا إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ If you thank, I'll give you more. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never give up. Thank more, you take more. Thank more, you take more. Thank more, you will keep your ni'mah on the ground. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Feels happy when a slave. Wallahi, some of us, we are nothing in our communities. Some of us, Allah, people in our communities look down to us. But maybe this person you're looking down to, in the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is better than you. Maybe you see him nobody. But in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's equal to you and your whole tribe. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, My slave glorified me. And then when you say, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِيمُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, because you admit, Ya God, Ya Allah, we worship you and we seek the refugee from you. We seek the help from you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is between me and my slave. In Islam, we don't have wasta between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In life we have. If you want to be employed somewhere, you need a wasta. Wasta is a person you know. Person who can make things happen. A magical person. A magic, I don't call him a person, I say a magical being. Because with a phone call, you got whatever you want. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is nothing like that. You don't have to go to the sheikh to kiss his hand to get something. No, you go to your room at the midnight, after, in the third night, in the third of the night, and you say, Ya Allah, and Allah will give you shabbat. You don't need any maulana in the, in the middle. No, 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 no. This is a great religion. It's a religion of no pride. Back in the time, they used to give what they call Sakul Jannah. In Rome, in old Rome, they used to sell a peace land of Jannah. Imagine if someone came and he was very fortunate and he said, you know what, I'll buy it all. So what is that? Like, we're not going to have a place in Jannah? Yeah? Because that person he is too wealthy and he got it all? <coughs> what if he, he said, I'll give it to everyone for free? So you do whatever you want because you have the certificate of the lot in Jannah. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَلُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافٌ كَثِيرًا And if it is from anyone but Allah, you will always see different things. And this is one of the different things we see. And then when you say, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ This is a dua. Ask him Allah to give you the chance to be one of those who are on the sirat mustaqim, the straight line to the Jannah. And guess what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, when you reach that point, this is for my slave, and my slave is entitled of everything he's asking for. You will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide you to the sirat mustaqim. Sirat of who? Sirat al-ladina an'amta alayhim. Who are they? Al-Anbiya wa Shuhada wa Siddiqeen. You want this path. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا الضَّالِينَ We all know who are they, مَغْضُوبَ عَلَيْهِمْ, right? Eh? Allah told them don't go to hunt on Saturday. They said, okay, we will follow the order of Allah. So what we do, let's put the net on Friday and collect it on Sunday. We didn't go on Saturday. <laughs> Play smart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's like, it's not so easy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hated them. Or he was angry at them. Because they have done. Musa alayhi salam come and say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, kill a cow. Okay, Musa, what kind of cow? Just a cow. No, no, we need details. 
Okay, it must be not old, not too young, in the in the between. In the between. In between. Okay, Musa, what color? If they sacrificed the first cow, it would, the story was over. But no, they have to ask. They have to ask in detail. They have to give Musa alayhi salam hard time. And some Muslims now, they, they do the same. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, I'm to read it. And this Abu Rasulakum Kama Suila Musa min Kabu. You want to ask your messenger just like Moses was asked it before? They never accept anything, everything. Ah, Allah gave them all the graces. We don't want this. We want to go to another land. They have been given everything, but yet they have to ask for details, they have to ask more and more, they have to give Musa alayhi salam a hard time. And Allah has warned us from these qualities. Allah has gave us the warning in the Quran, but how many of us read the Quran actually and understand everything they read? Don't tell me you don't speak Arabic today. Quran is in different languages. There is 270 copies of different languages in the Quran. Pick the Quran that match your language and read it. Read it. Read it and feel what is in there. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them, He was angry with them because they have known the knowledge, but they didn't practice. And some of us today, they know the haqq, but they don't practice the haqq. I want you to ask yourself, why am I doing this to myself? I know the haqq, why I cannot practice the haqq? And some of us are like the other team, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them, The misguided, those who've been set astray. Because they have done without knowledge. <coughs> Many of us today, they do things, okay, this is good, let me do it. Akhi, do you know if this is in Islam allowed or not? Well, I mean, like, it seems nice. There is nothing like seems nice. This is religion. You cannot say about something, it seems nice. Okay, let's do a party today. It's Mawlid and Nabi. Let's dance. Boom, 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 boom. What is this? Who did this before you? I love the Prophet Sallallahu I want to share my love. I want to dance to show that I'm... <laughs> what are you doing? This is not kind of monopoly or some game you're going to do whatever you want. This is a religion. You have to know what are you doing. Don't be like those who didn't know and they just did. And when someone tells them, but this is not in the Bible, they'll be like, huh? Because they don't read. We need to read our Quran. That is the gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulullah said in the hadith, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ شَيْئَيْنِ ما إن تمسكتم بهما لن تضلوا بعد أبدا كتاب الله وسنتي I have left behind me two things if you hold tight to them you will never be astray the book of Allah and my sunnah my way of living this dunya if you hold tight to them you will never be astray عباد الله الله سبحانه وتعالى is looking over you and giving you chances over chances. Don't be too full. The chance doesn't come twice. If you are safe today, you don't know what happened tomorrow. If you are now here with me praying, you don't know if I will die or you will die. You don't know if you can take the next breath. I don't know either. We have to be ready because the grave is very small. Don't look to your apartment. Don't look to your beautiful bed. Don't look to your car. Look where you're going to end up. You're not going to take with you no money, no cash, no houses with you, no family. You will be alone. In that time, if you think that your dad, your mother can help you today, your brother can support you today, your tribe can do something for you today, in there, you will be alone. And it's a long time of loneliness. It is the first step. Either to Jannah or to the hellfire of the Holy Hadar. Astaghfirullah wa lakum astaghfiru wa minahu wa lakum rahim.
عباد الله إن الله أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكته المسبحة بقلسه فقال عز من قائل يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن الله وملائك وقال عز من قائل إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا وسلموا عليه وتسليما اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد اللهم صل وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وارض اللهم عن أمهاتنا أمهات المؤمنين اللهم وعليك بكل شاتم ولاعن لهم يا أرحم الراحمين ادفع عنهم الأذى وارفع عنهم القذى ورد عنهم العدا يا أرحم الراحمين وارض اللهم على أبي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين عباد الله إن الله يأمركم بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينهاكم عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروا الله العظيم جل يذكركم واشكروه على نعمه يزدكم ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون